Hi everyone, and welcome back to Halx Programming. Uh, for over a thousand years, Constantinople was the center of the Western world and of the Christian world. And thanks to its location and its massive walls, it had withstood repeated attacks and sieges. On May 29th, 1453, Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Turks, bringing an end to what was left of the Roman, or as it's widely known today, the Byzantine Empire, and marking the end of the medieval world. For Greeks, the day symbolic is the beginning of over 400 years of, of Ottoman occupation. Uh, joining us today to discuss the events leading up to the fall of Constantinople in 1453, the siege and its historical legacy is the best-selling historian and author of the book 1453, Roger Crowley. Roger, welcome. It's great to have you with us. Thanks very much. I'm pleased to be here on this significant and I, and I suppose actually tragic day for the Greek people, but it, it's, it is... Uh, an important day in world history and certainly a, an important day for for Greek people. As I mentioned in the introduction briefly, Constantinople was the capital of the Roman Empire for over a thousand years. Uh, it stood as a first line of defense for a Western Europe that was just emerging out of the Dark Ages. But besides its role as a defensive bulwark, it also was a fountain of culture and learning. Uh, by 1453, however, the once proud empire was reduced to a small geographic space. Uh, can you tell us what it was like to live in Constantinople, the proverbial queen of cities in the 15th century? In the 15th century, it would have been a pretty constrained uh, and, and really rather desperate situation. Uh, the Byzantine Empire shrunk to the city, a little bit of the Bosphorus around it, and most of the Maria, the, the the Peloponnese. Um, it is encircled on both sides of the Bosphorus by, by the Ottoman Turks now, and the Byzantine emperors are more or less reduced to the status of vassals. The city itself, which at its heyday may have had a population of half a million, has probably shrunk to a population of about 90,000. There's been a population decline, the Black Death in the, in the 14th century, and it's like a, a kind of old man shrunk within uh, the, the close. There was said to be quite a lot of open space within the city uh, by this point. You know, you, there were fields, um, uh, people who went there, uh, travelers described it as being uh, in some parts quite ruined. A lot of the, the Asian monuments were not in a good state. Um, and... Um, it, it, it was certainly uh, under pressure, and it had already been besieged several times by the Ottomans, most recently in, in 1422 by uh, Murat, uh, Sultan Murat. So they were feeling the pressure. There's no doubt about it. The man who stood, I mean, by the 15th century, the Ottoman Turks had grown in power and established a very strong foothold, as you mentioned, in Europe. And... At this moment, there's a man who emerges as the new leader, Sultan, Sultan Mehmet II, and he desires, above all else, to capture the city once and for all. Can you tell us about this leader? Uh, who was he and what were his ambitions? Because I think it's important to focus on some of these, the individuals that drove the story, um, and we'll get to uh, Emperor Constantine afterwards. Yeah, uh, Mehmet was uh, 21 uh, in 1453. He was the only surviving son of the last sultan. And he's a complicated and interesting guy. Um, he, uh, he comes across as ambitious, aggressive, and uh, driven by um, a, lot of his, a lot of the ideology that comes behind it actually comes out of great learning because he was fascinated by the tale of uh, Alexander the Great. Um, he could almost certainly uh, read and speak great Greek. His mother was probably from somewhere on the coast of the, um, Dalmatia. And he used to have the uh, stories of Alexander read to him every day. And he perceived himself as being the Islamic Alexander, who was going to reverse the direction of, of conquest from the uh, east to the west. He had actually been made sultan by his father, who had abdicated uh, when he was still quite young in his teens. And he'd made an absolute mess of, of managing the empire that had been uh, 
uh, riots. There had been very controversial episodes concerning um, uh, the population and religious orthodoxy and so on. And Murat had to reinstate himself as sultan. So Mehmed actually has something to prove effectively. And the uh, deserted Constantinople, which has been very deep within the, um, uh, the, the, the mental geography of the Ottomans for a long time to, to actually capture this city, to be called uh, the Emperor of Rome, effectively, the, uh, of Rome, uh, was uh, something which they had long wished for. There's also a very deep Islamic trend to this because this goes right back to the uh, 7th and 8th centuries when the Arabs made two attempts to capture the city, failed, and this had a, actually had a traumatic effect, I think, upon uh, actually on Islamic theology because the worldwide spread of Islam was going to happen, but this sort of blocked it and they had to change their theology a certain amount. But it left behind uh, a whole load of prophetic sayings hadith, uh, which are actually attributed to the prophet, but were, were actually probably um, made up by other people. But these lingered in the air. And so this, this was coming back, this kind of jihadi thing was there, linked to this, uh, this Alexander thing in, in um, Mehmet's mind. But he's playing a high stakes game because um, he's already failed once as Sultan. And if he fails to do this, um, it, it, this could end up very badly for him. And there's quite a lot of, of pushback from the viziers around him that don't do this. This is too dangerous for you. you. You've made a mess of things once. Don't do this again. But this is a very arrogant, self-willed, self-confident man. And let's, uh, play, let's look at the man on the other side behind the city walls. And that is the man who stands in Mehmet's way. And he's the last Roman emperor, Byzantine emperor, uh, Constantine XI Paleologos. And he passed into legend and folklore after the fall of the city. But what do historical sources tell us about this man who did everything in his power to prevent the fall of Constantinople? Strangely, I think we know less about Constantine. We have no image of him uh, than we do about Mehmet. He was uh, one of four sons of the, uh, of the last emperor. Uh, He's, he's the only trustworthy one out of the, of the four. The other three are, are treacherous, aggressive, at least one of them marched on the city with the aid of the Ottomans. And his mother, Helena, insisted that he should be the Sultan. He's a man in his late 40s. He's a soldier. He's a very straightforward guy. Uh, he has spent 20 years trying to shore up the Byzantine position in the Peloponnese from incursions from the Ottomans. And he's very aware that he carries the legacy of 1,100 years of, of, of Byzantine. He's the 53rd uh, emperor, I believe. And he is going to go down to the last man. He is not going to step back. Um, uh, and he comes across as, as honest, straightforward, determined, loyal, and which can be said, cannot be said for a lot of the people around him, uh, a thoroughly admirable man. You mentioned uh, the legacy of you know wanting to take Constantinople being ingrained in the Ottoman uh, way of thinking and in Islamic thought as well. Uh, the title of your book, the, English, the American version, I'll hold it up in our camera so people can see it right here, uh, 1453. It's the Holy War for Constantinople and the Clash of Islam and the West. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, the religious feeling and sentiments that drove a lot of what we're going to be talking about uh, over the next, you know, 20, 30 minutes. On both sides? Um, Are I, you interested? Yeah, on, yeah, both, yeah. on both sides, yeah. yeah. Um, well, going back to uh, the Ottomans again, I mean, this does go back to these traumatic sieges of the 7th and 8th century when... Um, uh, th this this actually, as I said, had actually had a, a damaging effect on Islamic theology. The, the worldwide spread of Islam, right, the worldwide spread of communism was going to happen, and they actually had to change their theology behind it. But also it left behind martyrs, people who had died, particularly in the first siege, a man called Ayyub, who'd been the standard bearer of the prophet. And this kind of uh, imparts an extra religious significance 
for Islamic people on the city. Um, and so, you know, this which slumbered for a long time is brought back in the uh, 14th and 15th centuries. This memory of this place so that it's been um, designated as, as one of the places strongly linked to the Prophet uh, and that uh, it, it belongs to the Islamic world. On the other side, we have um, uh, the uh, Byzantine uh, uh, Orthodox uh, view of the city. We, ha we have to think of the extraordinary length of the life of this city, you know, continuous life. I mean, if, um, if Constantinople fell today, uh, it would have been a Byzantine city since the year 900, since the time of the Vikings. So a hugely long period of time. And around it uh, uh, accrued a similar level of prophecy about uh, the city, its future, uh, uh, and an increasingly pessimistic prophecy. The Byzantines were very, uh, very superstitious people, and um, they had incurred all kinds of prophetic uh, and increasingly negative uh, prophetic uh, sayings and beliefs, I think, which accompanied the decline of the city. That the city would would fall under an emperor called Constantine, whose mother was called Helena, uh, as it was founded and, and in the same way. Uh, that it would that it could only fall on, uh, uh, it would never fall on a waxing moon. Uh, and there were a large number of prophecies around uh, the, some of the gates of the city that, that were ill-omened, which probably do go back to the Arab sieges there. And so there was an, an extraordinary sense of religious foreboding around this, uh, of course. Um, but of course, into this, we also have to throw, and I'll throw it in at this point, the whole question of the, of the schism between um, uh, the Greek Orthodoxy and the Catholic Church in Rome, which goes back to 1054 when um, a cardinal walks into Hagia Sophia and places a, 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 a bill of excommunication on the Greek Orthodox who refuse to accept uh, the, uh, the see of the, of the Pope in Rome as being the ultimate um, authority and also religious questions around the creed uh, and which were very hotly uh, defended uh, and actually the anathema on the uh, Greek Orthodox by the Catholic Church wasn't actually uh, lifted until 1965. So this is going to go on a long way. Um, but this is going to cause huge amounts of problems for the defense of the city because the, the Pope uh, is quite adamant that he is not going to send help to uh, the Greek Orthodox until they submit to Rome. And there's a certain sentiment in the city of people. Uh, we, we have to see these people who are theologically you could say obsessed, were fascinated by questions of theology and a relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And um, they, I mean, there was a certain saying that a certain section of the population, rather the Sultan's turban than the Cardinal's hat. And Constantine, who was prepared to do a deal with uh, the papacy, was, to a certain extent, uh, very unpopular with a large part of the population. And this is going to hinder the defense because a certain uh, section of the Greek Orthodox population are simply not really going to participate in the defense of their city. They will not, uh, uh, they will abandon Hagia Sophia, so it becomes a dark church in the run up to the siege. Uh, and um, so the, the theological questions are very, very important, I think, within the whole life of Byzantium but also particularly in the way that the siege can be managed, Constantine's options, and the relationship with the West. And I'd like to dig in a little bit more to that, uh, because, and I think it's important to note, uh, if we, we didn't touch on it, the effect that, the impact that the Fourth Crusade in 1204 had on the Byzantine Greeks and their memory of it, the scars that it left were still very deep. Uh, so there's an extreme level of mistrust between the, uh, the Byzantine Greeks and the, the Catholic West. Uh, but as you mentioned, Constantine XI is ready to make a deal. He needs help and he engages in diplomatic activity to get that help. 
So he reaches out to Venice, uh, to the Italian city-states that have power then, to the Pope. Uh, can you, and you detail a number of these efforts in the book. Can you tell us a little bit more about how, how that played out? What hopes did they have of, hope, of, of help actually reaching Constantinople during the siege? Well, they they did reach out to uh, um, to Christendom. Uh, you know, uh, trips were made to Italy. Uh, they particularly looked to Venice and Genoa. Genoa have a their own commercial colony in Galata, or uh, just across the water from the Golden Horn. Both the Ven- Venetians and the Genoese are dependent upon trading. In fact, they've almost stolen the trade of Constantinople. Um, and they've got a deep interest in the city. They also have ships, and um, their maritime power is incredibly valuable because uh, the Ottomans don't really have a fleet. And so the look to the west is, is always there. Um, and uh, Genoese will come uh, to the aid of the city, uh, almost as individual initiatives, soldiers of fortune. Uh, Venetian, there's a Venetian colony that decides that it will fight uh, some of the Genoese who are uh, across the water in Galata um, come across to fight. Uh, and people do come in the cause of Christendom. Even Catalans come as far away as, as Spain. Uh, and so you get you get a, a mix of, of peoples who, who come to fight. These are not large numbers, but some of them are, are, are very highly trained um, soldiers. And particularly significant was a man called Giovanni Giustiniani, uh, a Genoese soldier of fortune, a yeah, very good. Yeah, I want to I want to talk about him for sure. And I'm sorry, I'm cutting you off. But we got a question in from our audience that I'd like to yeah. bring in that talks specifically sure. about this this character. Um, yeah. So Tom Banagas asks, uh, he'd love, you know, if you could speak on the significance or the reliance on foreign mercenaries at the time of the siege. And of course, he says that we know the most uh, we know a lot about Giovanni Giustiniani. We've heard a lot about him, but. Uh, what about other mercenaries and other support that that came to the to the city? And I would like you to detail some stories about Giovanni Giustiniani. Who is this man that essentially leads the defense of the city? I, little groups came from various places. Uh, as I said, Catalans came and fought and died. Uh, uh, some Venetians came. Uh, the Genoese came. Um, they. Uh, <laughs> One of the greatest oddities of this was a Scottish siege engineer called John Grant. Uh, so they, these people were not numerous, but they were good. They were technically uh, skilled and um, they came well equipped, uh, both in terms of uh, gunpowder weapons and in um, the, the knowledge of uh, the development of siege uh, engineering in the 15th century is, as, as throughout Italy, people start to build large forts, they have to be attacked and defended. Um, and uh, Giustiniani, I'm not quite sure what his provenance was in terms of, um, he'd certainly taken part in, in, in the complicated city-state wars of, of Italy in the 15th century. He actually probably came via Chios, which was a, um, a Genoese um, uh, <clears throat> island at that time, and he comes with about seven or eight hundred men. And generally, as far as we make out, these guys are in for the long haul, or they may be mercenary. There's no evidence that actually Constantine was paying these people. Uh, they seem to have come of their own initiative for a cause, rather like people going to fight in the Spanish Civil War. They believed in the cause, and, and it's unclear whether they hope for great rewards out of this. Constantine may have promised some things that Constantine actually didn't have a lot to offer. But as far as I can see, almost all these guys went down to the last man. They didn't run away. So there's, there's a kind of backbone of, of maybe small scale, a backbone of pan-European belief that this was a cause that was worth fighting for. And... Um, uh, so these are these are not you know paid men. Uh, as far as I can see, uh, Justiniani had his own um, his own private army of seven or eight hundred men. Again, I'm not sure how these people were were paid or or, or whatever. But but they, so these these people had great value, even if they were few in number. 
in the book you mentioned that some chroniclers so by uh describe mehmet's army as a river that transforms itself into a sea and it's it's simply massive uh when it approaches the walls and by early april 1453 that wall that that army was there and ready to besiege the city uh can you tell us about the numbers on both sides you mentioned uh the mercenary numbers or here numbers like 700 um how did the defense compare to the to the forces of Sultan Mehmed? Numbers in medieval history are always complicated. There's always 400,000 of them when the Christians are counting them. Um, the best guess on the Ottoman side, they picked up a lot of volunteers who came along for the ride. But the best guess that I have is really about 80,000. Uh, and this would have been perhaps added to with camp followers, there would be a lot of animals and so on. Curiously, about 20,000 of those were Christians. Um, these are, are battles uh, of, the, because the Ottomans are well established in the Balkans, uh, particularly from the despot of Serbia, uh, George Brankovic. Uh, the, uh, and they are impelled to come, it isn't a choice. Uh, so um, there's probably about 80,000. We know that... Um, the Christians had 8,000 because, uh, quite honestly, um, Con Constantine counted them. He had a levy of the men. And so, you know, there are about 4,000 Greeks and there are about 4,000 others. And so, so it's about 10 to 1 is the, is the ratio. This is, not, this is not good, really. But if you think about the walls of Constantinople, just think about it. Constantinople is effectively a triangle. Two sides of it are water, and these don't particularly have to be defended because one side is the Golden Horn, and this is closed off with a chain, and the Ottomans don't really have ships. The other side of the Sea of Marmara is very difficult to uh, stage a landing anyway because of the currents. So the, everything has to be concentrated on the land wall, four miles. So really the defence is, is really cut down to this, to this one strip. So... The numbers aren't quite as disproportionate in terms of uh, of the of, of the arrangement of manpower. As, uh, they're still huge, but but it's but it's you know it, things tend to, to favour defences in, in uh, the defenders in medieval warfare. So you know it's not quite as bad as it looks. And you mentioned the walls, and the walls had stood for hundreds, if not oh, nearly a thousand years, and they had never been broken into except once during the fourth crusade uh so the, there was an element of confidence on the side of the defenders as you mentioned siege warfare tended to favor the defenders but and this is where i think this siege gets so such historical importance for world history uh mehmet had you know a, a an ace in his sleeve and that's the cannon can you give us some details on the cannon how did he acquire it uh just how effective was it really and this is something you mentioned in the book. What was the impact psychologically on the defenders to have to encounter the cannons? The cannon was, um, well, he had this huge cannon called the Basilica. Um, the Ottomans were early adopters of, of gunpowder technology. Really, they were very good at scooping out skills that other people had. And they, uh, and they really got, got gunpowder technology the forging or, or, of, of cannon from uh, technical uh, mercenaries out of the German-speaking world. Um, the, uh, the man who uh, is quoted as, as being the man who built uh, the giant cannon was a Hungarian cannon founder, founder called Orban. Orban actually offered his skills to Constantine, but cannon are expensive to make, and Constantine couldn't afford it. So he goes up the road to uh, Edirne, Adrianopolis, to uh, uh, Mehmet and offers his skills there. And um, the, uh, the Ottomans actually uh, forge their cannons mainly out of the melted down um, uh, bells of Christian churches in the Balkans. So they scoop up all this material. Uh, uh, Orban builds this huge cannon, 27 feet long, uh, a diameter of about 30 inches. Uh, this is the mother of all cannons, actually. And um, there's a test firing of this thing outside uh, Edirne. Uh, the the half-ton ball goes for uh, about a mile and sinks six foot into the ground. 
And he then has this thing hauled towards the walls of Constantinople at two and a half miles a day, you know, to, and he sends word to the defenders, this is coming. So, there's, you know, there's, there's a big build up to this thing. Um, but alongside this, actually, there are about 70 or 80 other cannons, smaller ones. Uh, so, and he really brings an, a, a unique number of, of gunpowder weapons to the siege. This is a, a fantastic achievement, not only in terms of the cannons, but in the logistical management of this. You have to have cannonballs uh, of the right size, which were actually uh, created by uh, craftsmen, uh, masons on the Black Sea and brought by ship. You have to have reliable stock for gunpowder. So he brings together a whole load of, of logistical skills to the walls uh, with the giant cannon. Uh, and um, there's undoubtedly the psychological effect of, this, of, of these gunpowder weapons on a scale which has not been seen before. Although it's interestingly that Murat, his father, had brought cannon to the walls in the 1420s and they hadn't really had much effect on the walls. They were too puny and he couldn't find them for long enough. So the development of, of these uh, logistical and, and uh, engineering skills was quite uh, significant in the 20 years afterwards. Um, actually, the, the, the basilica was probably working at the limits of, of uh, metallurgy, and, it, and I think it cracked uh, quite early on. But it was the other cannons, really, which would do the damage. Because if you've got an unmoving object, uh, like a wall, and you, you can get your range and you can keep pounding uh, the walls again and again. Uh, but the psychological effect upon the people was extraordinary. These, these shots coming over the walls, crashing into the explosions. And um, it, within the prophetic world of, of, uh, of Byzantine Constantinople, it felt like something like the end of the world. It had this kind of extraordinary power to uh, to unnerve people and the great Theodosian walls which had been there for 1100 years fantastic piece of military engineering and anybody who wants to go and look at a, a, at a technical marvel you know go to Istanbul and look at these walls they are a wonderful piece of work still there um, uh, start to crumble under the force of, of the walls uh, of the bulls and actually, although um, Constantine had a few cannons, when he tried to mount them on the platforms of, of, of the towers, they started to shake them very badly. So in point of fact, the, this incredible piece of engineering was becoming obsolete. However, Justiniani comes up with a fairly ingenious solution. As the walls start to crumble, with the aid of the whole population of the city dragging up earth, and uh, timbers and so on, he creates earth bulwarks. And um, these actually are very effective because it's like throwing stones into mud. And so he's able actually to negate quite a lot of uh, the effect of, of the cannons uh, and, and kind of not neutralize them because they do do damage. But he's able to fill in the, the holes. And this is, this is very frustrating for the Ottomans. So, you know, he, he managed quite well for a long time. When I was reading the book, it, it almost felt, I think it's, it's so well written that I, it felt like I was on the walls watching the defense happening in front of my eyes. Uh, but the city was able to hold out for over 50 days, really frustrating uh, Mehmed and the Ottomans. And, you know, what were some of the ways you mentioned this bulwark that Justiniani built? What are some of the other ways that defenders were able to hold off the Turks? And after that, I've got a couple questions in the audience that I'm going to bring in. Well, uh... Firstly, ships do come. Pope sends a few ships. Um, uh, Mehmed has constructed a, a fleet by, uh, by this time using Greek sailors, which rather stunned the uh, Byzantines when they turned up outside the walls. But when, the, um, when these four ships turned up, they're big high-sided sailing ships, there's a sea battle off the walls. And um, Mehmed's fleet swarms out to surround these ships. Their, their galleys are quite low in the water. And... The population is watching this from the walls. Mehmet's watching it from uh, um, the, the land side, uh, urging his fleet on. And the Ottoman fleet is humiliated. It, it fails to capture these ships, um, which make their way. Uh, the, the chain is opened into the Golden Horn. And this is a severe blow to the morale of the Ottomans. Maybe they can't uh, 
maybe they will not be able to take the um, the city at all. And um, so uh, there, there are counters for that, which we might come to in a minute. But the Ju Ju Justiniani makes um, judicious sallies outside uh, outside the walls from time to time. The important thing is to stop uh, the Ottomans filling in the moat. There's a moat uh, quite deep, but we don't know if it had water in it at, at that time or not. It was floodable, but we think it probably wasn't. But the key to a, a final attack is going to be filling that in. Otherwise, you've got to drop down eight feet and then drop up again, uh, and it's hard work. And so clearing out the moat was, was really important to um, to the, the Christians. Um, Mehmet has other strategies up his sleeve, such as mining. Um, he he uh, has Serbian miners, skilled silver miners, who dig tunnels under the walls. These are very effectively countered by John Grant, the Scottish siege engineer. Um, they, they detect earth tremors by having buckets of water um, inside the walls. And when they see ripples, they know that the ground is being disturbed. They dig counter tunnels. Uh, and there's a nightmarish fighting in the dark. They pull down the, the tunnels and suffocate these intruding miners. And so that fails. Mehmet builds siege towers. Um, the Byzantines manage to set them on fire with Greek fire. Uh, and um, so uh, they're doing pretty well. You know, it's, it's, it's not going too badly. One of the hammer blows, really, I think, to the morale was that having failed to, um, his fleet having failed, Mehmet needs to get into the Golden Horn to put more pressure on, the, on, on that side of the wall, which is effectively undefended because nobody can get it across the water. So he has the, uh, 70 of his uh, galleys hauled over land, um, sort of up and down a very steep slope, uh, a distance of about a mile. Uh, and nobody quite knows how he did it. He has to go actually through Istanbul's main shopping street, as it as is now. And it's quite a steep incline. It's a one in nine slope. But in uh, on, on Sunday morning, the Byzantines are going to church. They look over the uh, over the wall across the Golden Horn. And they see these things being dropped into the water to their horror. Uh, and this is a, a serious blow. There are Venetian ships in the harbour, uh, and um, uh, it's quite possible that he might have had his galleys taken apart and, and reassembled. Nobody really knows, but it's um, there then follows a, a determination by Constantine to destroy this fleet. And um, in the dead of night, he sends his fleet across. It's betrayed probably by some Genoese. And his, his fleet is badly savaged by, um, by the Ottomans who are waiting. And some of the ships are sunk. The following day, uh, some of the uh, survivors who are swam ashore and being captured are impaled on stakes outside the walls. Constantine uh, retaliates by hanging his Ottoman prisoners. And we're going around this kind of spiral of violence, really. Uh, but you can only maintain a siege for a certain period of time. Uh, uh, enthusiasm uh, will uh, decline. Um, and some of... Um, the uh, uh, some of the viziers uh, uh, are, are telling uh, Mehmet this is dangerous. You know, if you don't succeed, you're in big trouble. Uh, a lot of people have come uh, for religious reasons to fight. Uh, some have come, but for the booty, they know this is a very rich city, or they think it's a very rich city, and so the stakes are going up for uh, for Mehmet, and um, it it it's not as clear cut as is made out that it, 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 it was a more close run thing, I think, than people uh, would think that, you know, he has his reputation having failed once as a younger man. And, and so some of his visitors are saying, look, you, you, you do better to just draw back, you know, but Mehmet's going to go for it, really. Uh, he's got nothing to, to lose, or he has to go for it. Probably. There's a part in the book that you mentioned, you know, and, and you talk about the logistical challenges that the Ottomans face uh, by keeping a siege for so long and the debate that's going on in his camp over, you know, how, whether he should pull back and what he should do. And you mentioned it's possible that, you know, had the defenders held out a little bit longer, that the city would have lived to fight another day. And I think this is an important, uh, important distinct question to make. And you said it, it's a much more close run affair. Uh, but we have a question coming from the audience that's in that same vein, and it's from Endi Zemanidis who asks, 
Um, is there any particular what if in latter Byzantine history that would not only have forestalled the fall of Constantinople, but maybe prevented the rise of the Ottomans? That's an interesting question. Um, there are quite a number of what if, actually. There's a whole chain of them. What if the Fourth Crusade had not uh, wreaked such incredible damage on the city? Is one. What if the Genoese had not ferried, ferried an Ottoman army across the Bosphorus in the 14th century uh, at the uh, duck at her head because they couldn't, there was no way they could have got across. Those are two that spring to mind. Um, what if um, a hung, uh, what if three failed crusades had done a bit better? What if uh, the, uh, the Hungarians had managed to uh, stage an advance on Constantinople. Mehmet was worried about Hunyadi, the um, uh, Hungarian uh, count, uh, descending on the city. So um, there, there, there's a whole string of these things, really, that, uh, that uh, could, uh, could have made a difference. Whether in the long run Byzantium was just running out of steam as a, as a you know, as a um, I don't know. Um, I, I'm, I mean, the Ottomans continued to be a minority for you know a long time afterwards. The Greeks are the majority of their of their uh, of their uh, of their um, population. So it's difficult to take one moment, but I, I can see a string of things really that might have made a very great difference. I want to bring us to uh, May 29th now. The siege, the, the defenders have been holding out for some time. The Ottomans, as you mentioned, had managed to get their fleet into the Golden Horn. Um, but the wall still held. And we're at a, a crucial point where if this next attack doesn't really work, there's going to be a serious conversation in the Ottoman camp about you know what to do next. Uh, but as we see in history, the morning of May 29th, the Ottomans broke into the city. Uh, there are accounts that say Constantine XI you know, jumped into the fray fighting, never to be seen again. Uh, can you detail the moment of the fall of Constantinople for us and its immediate aftermath? You know, what became of the defenders? What became of the city's people? I think just going back to the final defense, um, Constantine never had enough uh, men to defend two layers of walls. He decided to, def to defend at the outer layer. Uh, on the morning of the 29th of May, he marches his men uh, or gathers all his troops within the uh, between the two walls, and he locks the gates behind him. So there's no going back. It's it's win or die, and the Ottomans send their men forward in waves. Uh, most expendable first, probably the Christian troops, and then you move on from there. Uh, probably with enforcers behind them, janissaries to stop them turning round and running away, and. Uh, and for four or five hours, the defense does very well. He sends wave after wave of men forward and they, they fail. And eventually it's time for his crack troops, the Janissaries. And this is really the last throw of the dice. They've been fighting for five or six hours. The defenders are undoubtedly are getting exhausted. They are now being whittled down. But there are two critical moments that, that crack the morale. One was that somebody, a little sally has probably been made out to do something and they leave a little sally port open and some Ottomans get up onto the walls a, a bit further along and, and raise a flag. This spooks people a bit. I mean, they're, they're killed, but it, but it spooks people. And then the second thing that happens is Justiniani is, is hit uh, by something. The wound is not visible, but he knows he is, he, he, he is he's desperately um uh, he's mortally wounded and he says to Constantine Constantine has a key to the gate around his neck and says I've got to go I, I'm, I, I'm, I can't fight anymore and um, Constantine said if you go we're done you know 
because he's the iconic figure who's held it all together on on, on the military level. But uh, Justinian says, I can't fight anymore. So the gate, one gate is opened. And uh, when he's seen to go, men panic. And there is only one gate which is open. It's a very small gate. Uh, and at that point, the morale collapses. Uh, the Ottomans get up on the walls, massacre this group of, of soldiers, and then they, and then it's all over. They advance into the city, deep into the city. It's it, it's you know it's several miles, uh, but during the course of the day, they make their way all the way into the city as far as Hagia Sophia, where the population is hiding um, uh, uh, in the city, you know, praying. Probably ten thousand people. It's such a vast space. It probably was ten thousand people. The gates, the doors are hammered open. Uh, uh, initially, quite a lot of people are killed, but as they realize there's no defense, the Ottomans start to capture people because, because slaves are valuable. And it's all over, and the city uh, is plundered. Uh, and um, some people get away in ships uh, out of the Golden Horn, um, but a lot of people go down to the last man. and. Uh, Constantine, uh, the, the the Ottomans say that he he, he was killed running away, uh, but we like to believe, and, and I think it seems in, entirely in keeping with his personality, that he went down fighting and the body was never recovered. So um, it's all over by the end of the day. Uh, Mehmet makes a ceremonial entry through uh, the uh, gate of Adrianople Gate or the Adena Gate, as the Turks call it. And um, uh, he, he uh, makes his way into Hagia Sophia and he goes up onto the roof and he can look down on, on the city that he's captured. This is a symbolic moment for, for the Ottomans. And um, it's, uh, there's, 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 under Islamic law, they're allowed three days of looting, but they probably, the city wasn't as wealthy as people thought it was going to be because uh, let's face it, the Crusaders are taken a lot in 1204. Um, uh, but a lot of pe people are enslaved uh, and um, uh, it, it really everything had been stripped out probably in a, in a day. There's a question from the audience regarding the practice of slavery by the, by the Ottoman Turks uh, when they would take over a city. And it's from Paras uh, Kevaskis who asks about... Um, about the fate of the slaves. Where were they sent? Um, how many were able to return to Constantinople? I'm not sure that I know too, I don't know too much about that. I think um, uh, initially, they uh, probably a lot of them were taken away because the population of the city um, shrinks massively and the um, Mehmed has to have a sort of uh, a, a repopulation program, but a lot of the Greeks uh, do remain in the city. Uh, uh, actually, some of them are free men because some of the little enclaves uh, barricaded their own quarter and submitted to the uh, Sultan, and the, so they were allowed to remain there. Uh, and so was the uh, the, uh, the 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 new patriarch. Uh, um, the the wealthier were ransomed, uh, and we know particularly of uh, a man called Dukas and a man called George Francis, who was a personal friend of um, Constantine, and, and in fact, had uh, gone time with the godfather to his children. Uh, we know that his both his son and his daughter, these are noble children, they were taken to the harem, uh, and uh, Francis and his wife, uh, uh, finish uh, up their days in a monastery, I think in Corfu. So they were allowed to go for a sum of money. Um, I think it depended how wealthy you were as to what your fate was. If you were rich, you were valuable. Uh, if you were poor, you were probably taken away and resold. Uh, but it would be interesting to know more about this. I don't, I'm afraid, you know, I can't. Um, but I certainly think that most of the Greek I mean, in the first way, they're being slaughtered, but after that, they would have survived. They would have survived as, as goods to be to be to be sold on to other people. And you mentioned that um, this moment, obviously, it marks the end of the medieval world, as we talked about earlier in the program. And 
one thing you talk about in the book is that the fall of Constantinople was a 9-11 moment for the world at the time, where a situation where everyone could recall where they were when they heard the news. Uh, for Greeks, obviously, it's a symbolic moment that marks the beginning of the Turkocratia, or the 400 years of Turkish occupation. Uh, mm. But what was the reaction in the West and the rest of the world, and what's the historical legacy of the fall of Constantinople for world history? The the reaction in the West was was, was marked. Uh, obviously, it takes time for news to travel, but you know we have stories of people in Rome sitting down and weeping when they heard the news. Because Constantinople had been there so long, people assume it will be there forever. And it was a sort of constancy, really. And uh, it was widely celebrated. You know, the news reach, reaches Iceland. Um, there were songs, there were poems, there were ballads. Um, uh, it, 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 it was the beginning of, of, of a whole wave of, of, of anti-Turkish propaganda. One of the first uses of printing press was to print indulgences for people to go on crusade against the Turks um, uh, and for producing uh, diatribes against the Turks, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Antichrist. So, uh, and it had that, you know, these stories of people just knowing where they were when they heard it, particularly in Italy. Uh, well, well, have that kind of striking, you know, like Kennedy's been shot or, you know, whatever, 9-11. Um, and so his historical legacy in terms of, of, of starting this process of the terrible Turk, really, which is going to lead, you know, is be a thread throughout European history until the siege of Vienna, you know, until the, the uh, end of the... Um, 17th, early 18th century. So, and this is, um, it, it, although it was kind of obvious that the Turks were in Europe already, in the Balkans and so on, this kind of brought it home in a very, very dramatic way. Uh, and uh, in other ways, I think, I, I mean, it's more symbolic than, uh, than, than anything. It announced that the Turks were, were, were here to stay in the European arena and we know we're going to see this play out throughout in the Balkans as far as Vienna, we're going to see it play out in the Mediterranean, along the shores of North Africa, in Malta, in raids, in pirate raids across the Mediterranean. This is, this is going to be a constancy in, in European thought for a long time. There was a, obviously, you pulled a lot of resources from a number of sources, and uh, there's a couple questions that came in regarding, you know, some, regarding those sources. And I'd like to know, too, you know, which sources are the ones that you lean more heavily on? Um, which ones did you find the most compelling? Because we hear from from Greeks, we hear from uh, visiting uh, people visiting the city. We have chroniclers on Mehmet's side as well. Uh, so if you could tell us a little bit about about the sources and the primary documents that you read and maybe some that stand out that we could you know share with our listeners. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I curiously, there aren't that many sources um, because um, the the t t t Turkish sources are, are, are extremely unrewarding. Really, they don't have this tradition. I, I, I think it's probably recorded orally as much as anything, and they tend to write rather flowery and general stuff. Uh, there's very, very little, so we're dependent upon the Western sources. Um, we have Leonard of Chios, who was uh, the um, Genoese uh, um, and, and virulently Catholic and actually anti-Greek. So, you know, he has a particular slant of it. We have a Venetian doctor called Niccolo Barbaro, who wrote a day-by-day -day account, which is very, very valuable. We have a rather muddled but fascinating account by a, a Russian Orthodox uh, who probably came as a slave uh, 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 within the, um, uh, the Ottoman army and somehow escaped called Nesta Askander, which is really interesting to tease over. You have to, it's kind of jumbled, but it's okay, very vivid at points. It tells you about little one-to-one -one things. We have George Francis, the friend of, um, of Constantine. And we have 
curious, uh, 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 a guy called Kritovoulos, who um, was a Greek, but actually writes uh, a pro um, uh, a pro Ottoman. Uh, he, he's taken the Ottoman shilling um, uh, and tells us a lot about things like the uh, the uh, manufacture of the cannon uh, and a lot of detail actually. Um, and um, and then are various other little bits and pieces actually, but um, and, and there are songs, there are there are poems, there are um, the 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 um, the the dukas. Um, so, uh, but the Ottomans are really disappointing actually, apart from one letter written by uh, a, a sheikh, Sheikh Akshan Setin, to Mehmed in the middle of the siege. So they're effectively saying, I'm not very, doing a very good job. Uh, if you, if you, you, you know, this is going to go badly for, for you if it, if it doesn't. So we're dependent upon this small group of people, really. Um, and, um, and, and piecing together the story from these. There was a fascinating kind of detective exercise on which there are mysteries. You know, we don't know really how... Uh, um, the Sultan had his hit, ships hauled into the Golden Horn. We'd love to know more about the wall fighting, and um, uh, we'd love to know more about the way that the Ottomans um, uh, perceived their, uh, you know, what they were doing. Uh, and so, most of what we know about the Ottomans, we know from the Christian accounts of looking out of, of the just uh, on the final night before the attack, the ring of fire where they light fires, the ritual chanting, and so on. Um, and um, and actually, the sheikh's letter is quite interesting. He says, that, "Actually, don't be fooled. Most of the people who are here are not here for for religious reasons. They're here for the booty that they can get, which is actually quite interesting and um, realistic account of the motivation. But it, it's quite a tricky job to to put it all together. And um, you know, I suspect there are there are oral accounts." The, the, the Turks wrote down and people remembered stories and told them to their grandchildren, but they were all gone, unfortunately. You lived in Istanbul, Roger, and uh, today the event is celebrated in Turkey with a lot of fanfare, um, while it's solemnly commemorated in the Greek-speaking world. Uh, we had an earlier virtual event some time ago with Professor uh, Kiru discussing the fall of Constantinople in Turkey's imagined history, and I know you had made a comment about it to me before we went live and uh i'd love to get your take on and your thoughts on turkey's celebration of this event today and how how that plays out yeah i think it's very interesting i mean the uses of history political for political purposes when i first went to istanbul in the 19 in the early 1970s i don't remember any great fuss being made around this actually um, nor do I remember the cult of Mehmet, the conqueror, being very marked. You have to think that, who did you see? Uh, I mean, you did see pictures of Mehmet entering the city in, in T-shirts. But who did you see pictures of on the walls of, of T-shirts? Kemal Ataturk, the man who would have, who thought that the Ottomans were a, a degenerate um, group of of, of Fez wearing, uh, 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 you know, uh, totally decadent people, and who really wanted to, he wanted to tell Turkish history going back to where people from the, the center of the Asian steppes and the Ottomans are corrupt, and we won't forget about the sick man of Europe and so on. What has happened since then, really, is that the Ottomans have been rehabilitated in Turkish his, popular historiography as. This is our golden period. This is when we were great. And um, we're seeing the fall of Constantinople, which is now celebrated with um, a ceremonial uh, procession with people dressed up as janissaries uh, from the Adirne Gate, the ceremonial entry into the city, uh, and um, being used, I think, really within Erdogan's propaganda, really, certainly probably stirring up a great deal, uh, a certain amount of anti-Greek feeling along the way. Um, and um, I was fascinated with Professor Kiru saying, switching on the television by chance in Istanbul on the 29th and seeing every television uh, channel telling the story from the heroic uh, 
point of view of uh, uh, the Ottomans. And the Greeks being presented as sneering, evil, treacherous people with, uh, uh, you know, bearded uh, and it, I, reminding him of the treatment of, of the Jews. Um, but um, and they have a, a, really quite a, an impressive uh, sort of display, uh, a diorama. You can go and visit the 365 degree uh, present, uh, sort of presentation, painted presentation of the of the fall, really. And downstairs they have a a, a, a um, uh, an account of, of, of all sorts of things like how happy the Greeks were that they were going to be allowed to keep their their own patriarchy after the fall and so on, uh, you know, and be liberated from the clutches of the Catholic Church. Um, so uh, it, it, it's undoubtedly been being used, actually. Um, there's this series on, uh, on, on TV, which I'm sure doesn't show in, in Greece, um, uh, I got, got to say a few things on, although I haven't really watched it, called uh, The Ottomans Rising on Netflix. And I gather, because I didn't watch it very much, show it, that it skates over the very things that the Ottomans did. Uh, uh, so uh, it, it has been repurposed. The fall has been repurposed, I think, for uh, for uh, Erdogan's uh, the sort of Turkey for the Turks uh, and... Um, and uh, a certain kind of macho uh, thing, which is probably playing out in all sorts of other power politics within uh, the Turkish world at the moment, within the Mediterranean and and so on. Uh, so it's interesting to see. It's interesting to see. And, and uh, Mehmet himself, I think, you know, has you know is, is now uh, probably presented as you know the great intelligent hero, whereas actually, factually. Um, the uh, the uh, the Ottomans were heartily sick of uh, Mehmet by the time he died because he simply kept them at, to, uh, going back to continuous war really and he was actually really very very unpopular with 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 even the the Turkic speaking people by the time he died they were like, well, please we don't need to fight anybody else um, and you know he dragged his people to through endless endless rounds of warfare. So, yeah, we can see this going on, really, and we can see it probably linked to all sorts of other stuff that plays out in, in regional politics, the matters of Cyprus and so on. Um, uh, history has many purposes, really. What interested me when I came to write about this was that in the West, the importance of this story, certainly in, in the Anglophone, phone world, Stephen uh, Runciman, who wrote A History of Constantinople and uh, Byzantium and uh, before, the most important thing to him was that this was the death of the classical world of the great uh, Greek and Roman uh, world of the classics. Now we look at it very much more through the prism of, uh, you know, the uh, uh, a, a different story of the relationship between Islam and Christianity. So, you know, these events are re repurposed all the time. And I, I certainly think that they, ha they are being repurposed within the, within the Ottoman world. Roger, it's been great to have you with us. I know we've, we've gone a little bit over our time, but the conversation is so great, so I didn't want to cut you off at all. Uh, but I do want to give you the last word, and I'd love to hear if there's anything you're working on or anything you've recently worked on that you'd like to highlight for our, our, our listeners, because... Personally, I'm a big fan of all of your books. Uh, Empires of the Sea, City of Fortune have been fantastic, and uh, 1453 was a was a great read. Um, is there anything that you'd like to share with our readers about uh, what you're working on or what you've worked on recently? Well, uh, unfortunately, I haven't got a copy of my most recent book to hold up for you, which was about uh, the end of the Crusades. Um, uh, the, the, effectively, the Mamluks, the Turks, uh, wiping out the Crusaders in Acre in 1291. But... The book which really follows on from this book uh, as to where the Ottomans went next in the Mediterranean uh, was into the Mediterranean uh, um, Empires of the Sea, which, which really carries on seamlessly from Mehmet. Um, really, he's now got uh, he's now got a maritime uh, coast as well. And we see the Ottomans, you know, taking to the sea um, and we're going to see playing out their uh, siege of Rhodes. Um, Siege of Malta, uh, piracy within the Mediterranean, and 
towards the end, really, uh, uh, the matter of Cyprus, uh, 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 the taking of Cyprus. So um, that's that's the book which follows on from this one. But all these stories intertwine, really. Um, my book about the Venetians really uh, deeply involves Venice and um, Constantinople, uh, to the detriment of Constantinople, uh, part of the book is, is the, the Fourth uh, Crusade, which I think you've you know you've talked about, which is a devastating and shattering moment for uh, for the uh, Greek speaking uh, uh, world. So uh, I, I've returned to this in different ways uh, over the um, um, over the centuries. I'm mulling over what to write about next. I'm quite interested actually in um, the uh, the Ottoman uh, relationship to Crete and uh, the great siege of Crete uh, in the uh, 16th century. I'm also pretty interested actually in um, the, the weird uh, Venetian attempt to uh, reinvade the Maria in the uh, in the end of the 16th, early 17th century, when they unfortunately did it, the, the lucky shot does uh, terrible damage to uh, the Parthenon. But uh, but I haven't quite decided really. I'm I'm playing. I'm, I, the lockdown is an alternative for me to do a huge amount of reading round. So we haven't got to the end of it yet. I just want to talk. I, I'm I'm thinking about it. Uh, I'm ready in many different directions. My last book was about the Portuguese. Um, I'm inter- very interested in maritime history, um, and I'm I'm always fascinated by the Greek world. Actually, I you know I I love Greece and I formative experience of going to Greece when I was 18, 19 and you know, bumming around and walking around Crete and so on. So I'm always interested in what the what the Greeks are up to. Well, but thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and we're uh, excited to read anything you have uh, coming out next. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to read 1453, uh, I'm going to hold it up again for all of our viewers right here. Uh, make sure to pick it up. Uh, it's a fantastic book, fantastic read, uh, and anything else by Roger Crowley as well. I highly recommend it. Um, thank you all for listening and tuning in and for viewing. We've gone over an hour, so I want to wrap up. Uh, Roger, thanks again for everything and for joining us. We're happy to be a sounding board if you if you play around with ideas on re- the next writing topic. Thanks very much. It's great to share my passion for that, both Constantinople. Thank, thank you. you.